Welcome back to another episode of the My Latin Life podcast. My Latin Life since 2014 has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. Today, I'm joined by a special guest. Her name is Han Talbot, and she's the host of her own podcast, The Remote Life. So I'm happy to be joined by her today. Han, how's it going? Hello. That was a fabulous intro. I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Um, I first came across uh, your your presence and everything on Twitter, and I saw that you were kind of connected with all these different travel bloggers, uh, both in the Americas and in Europe. Um, funny, I, I did originally record an episode with uh, Jen Ruiz, uh, who, who I think you've connected with in the past, yeah. but or we tried to record, and the I was in this... Uh, kind of crappy Airbnb and Puerto Vallarta and my Wi-Fi just like made it unusable. So the episode never made it to the light of day. So I'm really happy uh, to have you on. <laughs> well, and so I'm happy to have you on because I think you'll probably be our first female guest. And mm-hmm. I'm trying to have a concerted effort to, to you know, highlight more women, um, digital nomads and have more women on the show and stuff. So maybe you can help me with that down the line. But we are um, out there, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I hope so. Um, and yeah, so that's that's something I'm working on. But yeah, we, we were talking a bit uh, offline. My Latin life, it's all about digital nomads and people working and living and interested in Latin America, trying to learn more about the different countries, you know, where are good spots to work online, uh, things like that, uh, from kind of everything on the on the fun side of things to getting into like advanced topics as well, you know, uh, generating income and, and all that. So, you know, in this episode, we can kind of talk about um, how to actually, um, you know, start making income as a freelancer, as someone working online, because uh, that's really the first step before most people can move to Latin America. You know, uh, you know, obviously you could, you know, be a, a dive instructor or English teacher or something like that. But I don't know, my, my vibe is personally, I think it's better to to earn the quid, earn dollars, earn euros, and then spend pesos and kind of move to these uh, less expensive places and, you know, save money and basically ball out and, and enjoy life. <laughs> so you seem to dream there. Um, well, I think my perspective on it is that I think – to give, my, to give you a little bit of background about me, I so I did a study abroad in, in Brazil back in 2013, happened to coincide with the World Cup, um, people always ask me. Um, and I figured that uh, I was I had a, um, I missed a flight when I, because I used to live in a tiny little island in the south of Brazil. And um, mm-hmm. I was on my way back from um, from London at one point, and I had, I missed a flight in Sao Paulo and realised, oh my gosh, I can sit in Sao Paulo airport and connect to wi-fi and do my like dissertation because my university at the time was like one of the only universities that got you to do your dissertation uh while you were doing your study abroad and I was like oh my gosh imagine like this is just incredible I can be working doing whatever I fancy like from wherever I want in the world and that kind of stuck with me afterwards was that because I, I then moved to London as a lot of us Brits tend to after we finish university and I could see the digital nomad movement, if you like, starting to take off, like, for real. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of thinking, yeah, this is a bit of me. I, I, do you know what someone once said to me? Oh, you'd be great in a corporate environment. And I don't think that I'm person I talk anymore. <laughs> so I was like, I cannot work in the same four walls, looking at the same four walls, five days a week. And so for me, the big push and like the big kind of draw towards remote life really stemmed from feeling and just changing up my environment all the time and, or, you know, at least a bit more routinely than going into a fixed office five days a week. And so from there, it was less about picking specific countries, although I still would pick specific countries based off on where I personally enjoy going and how speaking the language always helps. Mm-hmm. It, it would be less I think for me it's about okay I'd rather create my dollars as if you will to fit the place I want to go versus where's the cheapest place I can go 
is my mm-hmm. kind of purchase. Yeah, it's definitely not about the cheapest, uh, at least from my perspective, but more about just sort of getting a good value for your money. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I and uh, I, I do want to get a little bit more of your story. By the way, I, I was actually in the UK um, just this past October, November. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went down to, I went down to Torquay. I was, at, uh, I went down to Plymouth. I was in London for a while. I went up to Manchester and up to the Yorkshire Dales. So, uh, yeah. In little, winter. Little wow. That's a brave. <laughs> yeah. It, it was slippery. <laughs> um, but you, you know, it's, it's interesting. So you did, you went to Florianopolis, Brazil. Uh, while you were still in university, right? Yes. So that must have been quite eye-opening at the time. You know, you, you had alluded to that um, you had trained and studied for maybe a, a specific career um, and a specific skill set. And going to Brazil was probably a really, really eye-opening experience for a university student. It was, I was on a podcast um, back in December and they were like, okay, so like, how did you, how did you prepare? Like, what was it like and I was just like how long have you got like because <laughs> it's yeah especially back so I yeah 2013 so 10 years ago um with the internet was not what it was today what it is today even so preparing for a culture that is very drastically different from what I know and in a continent that didn't speak uh, a lot of English at the time as well it's quite a for someone who's just learning a language as well because I've obviously done a bit of Portuguese at university but it's just not quite the same as when you then get thrown into both the language full-time and then also the culture nothing can quite fully prepare you for that shift coupled with the fact that they were obviously then at the time um, building up to the World Cup as well it was all a very big different experience at 20 years old Um, but that then gave me like that's how I got introduced to content creation and that's how I then like pivoted to where I'm at now because I realized okay maybe I'm not uh there isn't as much information for me to see why don't I then be that person who creates that information so that's kind of where I pivoted Mm because I picked a languages degree because I loved I well I'd been speaking Spanish as a second language since I was a small child anyway but then I just loved language learning I was that kid in school that just I wasn't good at maths, I wasn't good at science, but I was good at languages. So that's kind of what I picked for my career path. And then you get to university and people are going, oh, so what, you want to become a teacher? No. Nope. You want to become a translator? No. Nope. All these different bits and pieces that people kind of expected you to go into at the time. And I wanted to do none of it, none of it. even down to, oh, you could go do a corporate job. Yeah. Sounds nice, but nah. So then I picked up doing blogging and content while I was on my year abroad as well while dealing with all these things um and yeah I remember it was I thought I was so cool and on trend doing a lime green font for my <laughs> website um but yeah that that's where I really started kind of seeing what the possibility of social media and content creation from there while also dealing with uh the fun of a new culture yeah it wasn't too awfully um- <laughs> what what was it about uh what were some of the things about brazil that really struck you as different about uh where you came from it's funny to try and think about it now because i got so used to it and i actually love it but i remember as, as a 20 year old going into a new culture like that i think some of the biggest things for me were just kind of some um oh, just some of the mannerisms a lot of the time, just how kind of people were with... A, a big thing normally, of course, it would have been the fact that, like, the stereotypes people associate with Brits, for example, the kind of thing, and especially at the time, like, the first thing I'd, I'd just arrived and the first thing they said to me was, so, was uh, so what do you think about the fact that Prince George has just been born? And I was like, he's born, congratulations, like, and they expect me to have a whole opinion about it. It's another day for us Brits, it doesn't matter that kind of thing um and that I should have an, oh and they thought that if I didn't have tea uh, at 4 p.m in the afternoon then I must be going crazy like <laughs> it was just these funny little stereotypes that were put on top of my head um and then uh I think I can't, this is the thing I can't quite describe it but I think it's just the 
change in pace of lifestyle as well, especially in Florianopolis. Like they have a whole like kind of word to describe um, this kind of lifestyle in Portuguese, Jivaga. And it literally is kind of this combination of like slow, not going anywhere fast kind of feeling. And that was Florianopolis for me. Um, it was like coming from a place in, you know, in the UK where like everything's very efficient, everything's kind of generally done on time. You can kind of expect things to be completed to Brazil where it was like, it'll happen when it happens. Like life will happen when it happens. The bus will turn up when it, ha- when it does. Like it was just such a very different pace of life in that respect um mm-hmm. yeah uh and of course you're surrounded by beaches like um, i do that i'm not saying it's bad at all but of course like when you're surrounded by an island of beautiful beaches I don't really think you can really expect things to be fast-paced uh <laughs> mm-hmm. um but it was yeah things like that which now looking back on it i'm like what what was i thinking that was that was great but i think at the time i just found that quite confronting because I'd never quite experienced something like that but now I'm like that's exactly what I'm aiming for like I want to be in a place where like, I can go to the beach and like chill when I want to and people just live I think that's what it was it was like you're going to a place where people just want to chill live like it's all good vibes <laughs> mm-hmm. that and so that like? first it okay. does it does and so that first trip to Floripa was I guess a, a full semester or how long were you down there yeah, so I was there for a year in total. Oh, wow. Yeah. Not, not bad. It, yeah, I can't complain. It was definitely a... It was confronting for, for someone who, you know, is kind of away from family um, for the first time properly ever and, and whatnot in a, in a different culture. But I'm still very glad I did it and I knew going into it that I'd be glad that I did it, if that makes sense as well, because I wanted something that was very different from life in Europe. That was my big thing. And it's still something that I talk about so much with people nowadays. So it was, yeah, different, confronting, but it's still one of the best experiences I've done in my life. And so now all these years later, I, I imagine you probably spend some time in Portugal. Um, do you keep the Brazilian accent or have you adapted to Portuguese uh, from Portugal? I do. I keep the accent as much as possible. And they always ask me, are you Brazilian? So I then feel like, ah, I'm doing okay. (laughs) I try not to because there are some differences, obviously, between European Portuguese and Brazilian Portuguese. Like there are certain words that mean, like they literally are the same word technically, but they mean two different things in Mm -hmm. European uh, Brazilian Portuguese. Um, and then they also do verbs slightly different, but that's then where I get like, oh, well, you're Brazilian, you don't, you don't sound Portuguese. And I try to make sure I don't let it slip as much as possible. That's one of those little pride things that like I spent long enough learning it and getting it right that I don't want to change it. Nice. Okay, good. So you kept this Sotaki Brasileiro. Claro. Um, <laughs> um, I think what's interesting about uh, how you got into online business and building a blog and online presence is that you came from uh, a linguistics background, right? Mm -hmm. I think that would be accurate to say. And so you knew that you wanted to learn foreign languages, which basically meant that you were going to have to live in foreign countries and you were going to have to find a way to make that work, to basically earn a living, live in foreign countries and sort of support this lifestyle, this international lifestyle. And so you managed to find your way into, uh, I guess, first blogging, because uh, you wanted to share what you were learning. Uh, and, and you found that there was like a, a niche or a, a, an empty space where there was a need for content that you were looking for. So you're kind of serving your own need. Um, how were you able to basically start monetizing how quickly were you starting to sort of see um, sort of positive results and feedback and growth and sort of how have things sort of taken off from um, like a business perspective? Yeah. So uh, again, it's a funny one. So I did content because I love content. I was like that person in university that everyone was like, Oh my God, you're always on Facebook or always taking pictures like before we kind of understood it. Um, 
And so, yeah, I created this blog and I thought, I, I, lit I literally said to a friend when I was on my year abroad, I'm going to create a career from social media. Didn't know how, but I remember watching like, you know, the likes of Zoella, Fun for Louis and all these guys back in the day and thinking, right, that's what I want to do. But so what I did was I started, so I got my first job out of university using social media. Like I literally kind of went through even my full time career for the first couple of years out of university using social media and using my website building skills if you will I say in like inverted commas because yeah my first website build was not great at all um but just instead of going down the kind of traditional cv route I would build up my social profile so that I could be like look this is what I'm capable of doing uh yeah. I can create a website more or less and it got better obviously I would hope you've seen it yourself over the years um and just going, instead of going down the content creator route, I went down the marketer route instead, um, which people are always surprised about. But yeah, so I, then I started going in different marketing roles specifically because I, I like social media. I like kind of seeing where this could go. I then started really loving strategy. So I did a, I did a mixture. I went from marketing to SEO to PR um, and yeah, ended up basically in events. So then back in 2019, I then thought, oh, this is where I then come back to, you know, I uh, I like doing things on my own terms and working wherever I like too much mm -hmm. to keep going um, in working from offices. So in 2019, I said, right, I'm going freelance. Um, jumped probably before I was completely ready, um, but still one of the best decisions I've made to this day especially during the pandemic people were like oh my gosh like how do you feel this must feel so bad no it was still one of the best decisions I could have made um ever because I had um being on off remote working in my full-time jobs anyway um I got permission from different people done projects based on remote work but yeah that was then where I really thought no I want to do a job where not only I'm working on my own terms but then therefore as a consequence creating better results because I'm working in a better, like a much better environment for myself. Um, mm -hmm. And all my skills essentially kind of just seem to work and create a project management very well. So from there, I just started doing again, uh, doing different, essentially I, my first kind of full-time contract, I still negotiated remote working. And so from there I did like half and half um, while I still lived in the UK. Um, and obviously then the pandemic rolled around and <laughs> remote working became a lot more kind of easy to do for different people. So, yeah, a lot of my my income largely comes from full time client work or part time client work mostly. And that's kind of how I built it from there. Um, rather than spending money on things as well, I will I've, I saved a lot of money as much as possible um, during our lockdowns so that I then had a good buffer when we came out of it too just in case like not because I expect anything bad to happen but just have it there so that I can take time off if I want to and just to do like day-to-day -day projects as well mm -hmm. and I imagine this maybe allowed you to stop commuting into the city something like that live in a I, one thing I noticed about the UK is the countryside was just so nice and yeah. I was like <laughs> I saved so much money um, from even doing half a week commuting into London. It was rather insane in the end, um, especially looking at my like, wish list that I built up over the like the years. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, no, I so I lived in um, I stayed I moved back to my parents' house uh, for the pandemic just to obviously be with family as a lot of people did. And yeah, having the English kind of, have you seen the film The Holiday with Cameron Diaz? Uh, I've seen like the first 15 minutes, yeah. <laughs> so the cottage that uh, she stays in, I was based in the village next to where that is filmed. For... I do know you're talking about, I do know, I do know you're talking about the, the cottage, yeah. Yeah, so that, that cottage obviously doesn't really actually exist in real life, but where lots of that is filmed was where I was staying during the pandemic. So yeah, had the hills, had like, yeah, lots of space, which I am very thankful for <laughs> during that period. Okay. I'm sure uh, any of your friends listening might want to know what part of the UK you're from, if you mind sharing that. Of course. I, if you've not picked up on the accent, uh, I'm from Surrey, which is south of London. Okay, cool. 
And so there's like train, like it's like I know the trains into London are like it goes far. It goes there's like hour long trains. Yeah, so I think that. my nearest one was always half an hour, so from Guildford, um, which mm-hmm. is on a line from Portsmouth, which I think is a couple hours. And I never used to envy the people who would get the five a.m. train from Portsmouth all the way into London every day. <laughs> and another thing I noticed in London when I was there was I was really. Su- surprised by how big the brazilian community is Um, in london i didn't realize that it's like literally like hundred thousand plus strong and it's probably one of the biggest in europe there was a big one in dublin when i was there a big community in london and um obviously a big community in portugal and it was in um there's an area of london called baywater i believe Mm -hmm. that they call brazil water oh how funny and um yeah and and i was over there and i was talking to some people um and they said that a lot of people um they either have uh portuguese or italian ancestry and they sort of got that italian ancestry passport and then they decided to you know obviously come over to europe but they wanted to be they didn't want to be in portugal they wanted to be in an english speaking place to you know learn english and make more money and sort of have that different experience and that's why um there's a lot of brazilians in london and in dublin yeah, there's a lot of pockets of Latin American um, communities in London. I think you have to kind of do a little bit of an extra search to find it a lot of the time. Um, so there are two markets as well that, I, again, I don't know what they're like post-pandemic, but um, when I lived in London, there was one uh, in Elephant and Castle that was quite um, big as well, uh, near the mall. And then there was also a, I think it was literally called La- the Latin American market, um, near Seven Sisters, which is a bit north uh, London, um, and again you'd literally walk in, and it was just all you'd hear was Spanish and Portuguese. And like I remember, I took a uh, old housemate, and I was like gushing. I was like, "Oh my god, I can get all these things without paying crazy like export tax and all the rest of it." And he was like, "Okay, Han, cool," and like you know, get coffee for like you know two pounds, and it would blow your head off. It was just like proper strong Colombian coffee, and yeah, oh, I'm yeah. sure. Uh, there are pockets um but i i will admit that i've had to do searches in both spanish and portuguese at times to actually find some of those things but they're there and yeah and by the way you said you've been speaking spanish uh since a a young kid i mean how did that come about yeah so i mean i was again that kid that um my my mom used to sit me in front of um you know little good old vhs's back in the day um but we were on our like you know once a year holiday to Spain, and I was like, "Mom, I'm gonna be fluent in Spanish." Um, that was me at like six, seven years old. Uh, we then actually happened to move to Spain when I was a kid. So yeah, we were there when I was ten to fourteen. Um, yeah, stuck me in Spanish school, so I became fluent by thirteen, fourteen. Okay, that's Good awesome. Life Good life skills. <laughs> Yeah, the Brits in Spain is a strong community. <laughs> Love a bit of Costa del action, so uh, Costa del Sol action, even. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. And uh, to give people a little bit better idea, I'm sure there's people where you know we're trying to inspire them to work online, and they're just trying to think like, what can I actually do online to earn money? How do I get clients? Uh, I'm sure you've come across a lot of these really common questions. So, like, when you say that you do freelancing, I imagine it's, like, uh, and social media stuff. Like, what are you doing? Are you doing uh, SEO and copywriting? Or are you doing sort of, like, uh, paid acquisition and ad spend? Or, like, what specific segment do you specialize in? Ah, so that's the beauty about uh, creative project management is that I can do a, a very big range. Um, but so for people who are looking to get into it, I would say that the best thing to do is to pick one or two skills that you are good at and you can sell well and you can put on a portfolio and show your results. So whether that's social media management, if that's SEO, if that's strategy, whatever that is, pick something that you know you're good at and you enjoy doing and can sell well yourself. You can pitch to clients because Mm -hmm. especially in the early days, it it takes effort. It takes some time um, and you won't get people flocking to you straight away um, until you've built that kind of commu- well, built up, built up your network so people know who you are and what you do that built up your results. So 
for me, a lot of it was putting out on LinkedIn, you know, putting up on my LinkedIn, I've done this. It was about showing off the press coverage I've got. It was about showing the different social media um, posts that I've done and the results from that. So, mm-hmm. and for me, that's to answer your question originally as well. So I do a mixture. So again, uh, I started off with project management for events. Well, this was pre-pandemic uh, for events and uh, influence marketing campaigns then uh went into virtual events with the pandemic um some of it was social media strategy and it just has been a big mix mix of that basically since so uh like i I worked with um, a company to launch um another campaign again last year that was project management but again it's social media uh i'm working with a client on tiktok strategy at the moment it varies it really varies Mm -hmm. and so let's say uh we have someone listening to this that sort of works in the tech industry in in social media or or so, one of these skills that's quite common uh to to start building a, a freelance uh business around um so be it copywriting seo whatever social media management what would your biggest um recommendations and advice be to that person for them to start working freelance um getting and getting clients and maybe like keeping sticky clients that um, mm-hmm. it's not just, you know, like short term projects, but something that's maybe a bit more recurring revenue. I'm going to kind of answer your question, but not answer your question, um, just because of kind of how I've seen the freelance space move. Um, the best advice I can give at the moment is figure out first why it is you want to go freelance, figure out why it is you want to remote work. Like that's because a lot of people will go, oh, it looks like your life is so easy. I'm like, cool. Okay, if I've convinced you my life looks easy, then I've done a very good job, quite frankly. Um, I'm not saying my life's not easy, but it takes effort. It requires effort. Some of the easiest looking things, like there's a joke in the content creation industry that if something looks easy, there's normally a lot of effort that's gone into it. But that's the point. Um, So if you're just looking for a life on the beach every now and again I'd maybe rethink why this you're going freelance so if you're looking for a kind of whole different setup and lifestyle then you're already winning so I would say figure out your why and figure out what it is you're you're actually wanting from the lifestyle first um because not enough people really think about it and whether they're willing to commit to it it's not a problem to have a full-time job and work in an office it's just and you know go on occasional beach holidays that's so cool but yeah you've got to kind of have a really honest conversation with yourself first I would then say that again it could go either of two ways you can either do what I did which is build up a buffer of money and then start pitching to clients but that's quite risky or Mm -hmm. you can start trying to find clients while you're potentially in full-time education or full-time work now and start building that roster on the side Another obviously great option that we have now, having had the pandemic where we've all been remote working for a lot of it, is that you can ask your employer now. A lot of employers are actually quite open to remote working. Um, I saw like Monzo, for example, is actually allowed, like going one step further and actually allowing companies to take time off to go do projects and travel and all the rest of it. So I would say have an honest conversation with yourself first. And then t- see what route it is that you want to take. I knew for me that I wanted to be traveling and I wanted to be able to build my work and build my money around my lifestyle rather than be needing to go to an office all the time. But that's not for everybody. It's really not for everybody. So, yeah, I think that I kind of answer your question, but not. <laughs> no, I, I think people will find that helpful. Um, personally, you know, moving to remote work was the most impactful thing I've mm. ever done. I mean, I'm here in uh, Cabo San Lucas, Mexico right now. And just this morning, I woke up before the sunrise, I ran down to the beach. And it was like a full moon super moon uh, mm. last night. And so I had the super moon setting over the mountains on one side, I had the sun rising over the ocean mm. on the other side, you could see both at the same time looking over the whole bay of Cabo San Lucas and it was so epic Mm. and you know that that would have been impossible if I was working in an office back Mm. in Canada or another um, cold city you know 
in March. No, for sure. And that's something that motivates me as well. That's yeah. I was in Split in Croatia for a month and I love the fact that I could literally, I was like, right, I need a break from work. So I literally three minutes out the door and I was on the beach. That for me mm-hmm. was just the best thing ever. Um, but I think a lot of people don't quite realise that it's, yeah, it's not all beaches and sunrises and super moons. Like there is a little bit more to it. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I know you are kind of short on time, but I wanted to ask, um, so what in, inspired you to start the podcast? Uh, sure. Your podcast being uh, The Remote Life. Uh, so wanted to plug that a bit. And so what inspired you to start it? And how's it been going? And, um, you know, what's what's the future hold for the podcast? Yeah, so um, I worked in the content creation. Well, so I've been in the content creation community in and out for the best part of nine years at this point. And I think a big thing that I was noticing uh, was the fact that obviously we had the digital nomad movement. Then we kind of had remote working already sort of building up already. Um, and what I was kind of noticing from the space was that we had kind of this gap really in the community where there were some really great people who had some really great stories and we weren't really talking about it. Cause as you and I know, like, remote working remote life is actually super tangible if you really want it it's such a tangible thing but there weren't really these stories being heard um and sort of just more awareness of like different nomad communities um and just yeah that all those kind of wonderful stories basically that I was like I want to tell them I want to tell them so the remote life was born out of being able to answer questions that I wasn't seeing answered and also telling stories that I knew were there and available to be heard from different travel bloggers, from people who work, who are building businesses while being based somewhere, but also being remote workers. So it was just that kind of thing. Um, and then the future is that, um, honestly, I, I'm just kind of rolling with it at the moment, seeing where it goes, but I have got a couple ideas. And I think I don't know. I don't want to say too much <laughs> because I have this the habit of being like, yeah, your ideas. And then, yeah, not always being able to do them quite in the way I'd like to. So future is series three is already underway. Um, and we've got our first, first collab happening in Mexico City uh, in April. So that's going to be exciting. Um, Wait, what's that? Then, pardon? What's that? Collab? Collaboration. Yep. Okay, what's ha- what's happening in Mexico City? You're gonna have to stay tuned. <laughs> okay, well, I'm in I'm in Mexico. I'll be in Mexico in April, so let me know if uh, what's come hang come hang out in Mexico City. <laughs> gonna be in Mexico City for five weeks. Come hang out. I, I definitely could. <laughs> Do it. And but yeah, no. So yeah. I want to build up on that. Um, sorry, just to actually not go off on a massive tangent, but yeah, I want to build that up, and uh, I'm hoping to build that into more of a business and brand in its own. Right. Definitely. I know what you mean about everyone having a story and there being a lot of stories out there. I mean, I've been, you know, I visited a lot of the digital nomad hubs in Latin America. And what I've noticed is that every single person basically has like a totally different way of making money, a totally different business, Mm -hmm. totally different industry. And what's weird is like, we're all together. We're you know, going for beers together and this and that. Mm. But we're all like working on separate, completely separate things. Um. My favorite <laughs> thing was going to split. And uh, so being an events planner by trade, I was like, I'm going to like just see who's around for a, a drink and whatnot. And it ended up being like this event of like 20 people with our own set menu in the end. It was fantastic. Um, but one of my favorite conversations was that I just, I sat down, I've just got to know these people for like for five minutes and someone went, so taxes and they're rather like on a normal conversation, people would be like, what? But I was like, do you know what? This is interesting to know. I have no idea, but I want to be able to like hear about like how you do your taxes and how different people do it. I loved having those random conversations that you can't, you can only have with a certain few people. That was great. It was good fun. Yeah, definitely a lot of smart people out there. And I think what's happening right now in some of these digital nomad remote worker communities is a lot of new ideas are being formed because this whole remote work thing Mm. is barely 10 years old. You could argue it kind of started 
with Tim Ferriss and the Four Hour Work Week, which I think came out in two thousand and nine, um, but really only started like really really taking form. I feel in like maybe two thousand and fifteen, and so when I'm in Medellin or Playa del Carmen or you know whatever it is in Europe. Um, you know, we're, we're coming up with a lot of these ideas around um, community and co-working and co-living and different things like that for the first time. And it really has a really interesting energy in the same way where, you know, maybe New York in the 80s was a point in time or San Francisco in the 1960s was a point in time or, you know, London and the whatever, the Beatles era or something. I feel like... Um, right now like what's happening in some of these digital nomad communities is one of those like really special point in times that uh you just got to be there for absolutely i think if you can and if it's on your mind this is what i said about um doing study abroad back in december i was like if it if you've got the itch scratch it <laughs> like it's some of the things biggest things i hear is that people and even when sorry i when we just come out of the pandemic and I was heading off to travel back in October, so many people, like I would, they would say also, like, for example, when I sold my car, someone was like, oh, so why are you, why are you selling your car now? And I was like, because I'm going traveling. And they would say, oh, that's the one thing I regret in my life. I heard that so often, like, oh, good for you. Like, go travel, go see the world. Like, that's the one thing that I regret. And I'm, I think if you are also feeling that way inclined and you think you've got the, the kind of, determination to make it happen do mm -hmm. it like there is yeah it's like i said it's it's one of the best decisions i've made in my life one of the best decisions i've made in my life um yeah <laughs> if you've got it if you want to go do it do it what have been some of your favorite spots Oof. uh definitely check out split um Potentially, possibly in, uh, more of this summer, though, just because obviously it's shut for a lot of um, for half a year. Uh, Split was amazing. Uh, Lisbon, love Lisbon. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah, one of my favourites. <sighs> I'm looking forward to Mexico City. I think I would love to go back to Florianopolis because um, obviously at the time I was just sitting with like my pen and paper. This was like kind of pre-Wi-Fi being too widely available, but I think. I think there's even a Selena in Florianopolis now. There is, yeah. Yeah. Um, I would love to go back there. Uh, I enjoy, do you know what? I enjoy so many of the different places that I go. I mean, again, Bali, like classic. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's been any places that I've been that I've not enjoyed. That sounds really cheesy. Mm -hmm. But... I think, yeah, again, anywhere that you can especially go meet up with different people who are like-minded and have events, I've always enjoyed. So, yeah, again, that's Bali, Lisbon. Uh, oh, actually, Ljubljana was good. Slovenia, that was amazing as well. Have skiing. I've heard good things. Out, yeah, 40 minutes out of the city, go skiing. That was really fun. That's awesome. Um, I, I do know that you you want to get wrapping up. Um so with the little bit of time that we have left, um, is there anything that you would like to promote or plug from um, the projects and everything that you're working on? Oh, kind. Um, so, I mean, yeah, come hang out on the remote life. Obviously, if you want to check out um, Hamweek's World as well, that'd be amazing. But no, come and check out the remote life for people who are aspiring, uh, but also current remote lifers. Um, there are some amazing people. I'm not saying uh, that just to blow my own trumpet. Like I genuinely absolutely love every single guest that I have had the opportunity to speak to. Um, so, yeah. And then come and hang out in Mexico City, people, obviously. I'm down. I'm down. Oh, and one last question. I, I, was, I literally wrote this down to ask you. How did you get Nomadic Matt on your show so early on? That's, on, that's incredible. <laughs> uh, Matt, so um, he basically came to I think came to one of my events back in London because uh, I used to work for um, an influence marketing company uh, who also did events and I did one of I was their project manager for one of their London events um, but yeah him and I got chatting in Mallorca uh, so we went to one of their events back in Mallorca in November and yeah him and I got chatting and uh, asked if he'd join he was great bless him 
That's amazing. Yeah, you, you definitely seem to be a really good networker. And so, um, you know, hopefully we can work together on some stuff in the future. Maybe I can come on your podcast or you can kind of um, help me again, like I said, get, get more uh, women on the podcast and share their stories here on My Latin Life. Come check check out people on Facebook. This is another thing. Check out Facebook groups. Check out people on Instagram. People on Twitter always want to have a chat as well. We're all out there. There are so many networking opportunities, um, and people are always up for meeting like-minded people. So we're out there. There are so many people to go and chat to as well. Travel content events are out there as well. Like it's all. It literally takes. It's the funniest thing that I get asked is like, "Oh, what courses did you do?" Or like, "What?" I'm like, "I don't didn't do courses. I don't do courses. I use a little thing called Google." <laughs> and people mm-hmm. are like, "What?" <laughs> so check out Google. Do what you need to do. Come hang out. Like you said, have a couple beers with people. Like you, and the world itself and this community is a lot smaller than it looks. Everyone knows everyone. So just come hang out. <laughs> It's true. Pretty much every podcast guest I've had knows at least one of the other guests. So it's kind of just yeah. like a, a chain. I literally went to Split not expecting to like have any kind of connection to anybody. And I read, yeah, literally within one day, I was like, how do you know this person? So we all know each other. Amazing. And uh, Han, I didn't uh, mention this, but uh, when we do end the recording, don't like immediately exit your browser. Um, just stay on the line for a sec. Um, but with that being said, um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you for joining us on an episode of the My Latin Life podcast. Um, this has been this has been a fun one. Um, hearing from someone's experiences uh, coming from Europe, coming from a different background, and all that. And I hope uh, this has inspired people. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's been uh, fun to chat about all things remote life, which I love. Absolutely. And uh, hopefully we can make Mexico City happen. We'll see. (laughs) Mexico City, make it happen. All right. All right. Bye for now.